This is Mrs. Palmer Quay with the third video for Module 16. In this video, I will be talking about the galvanic cell and how we get electricity from chemistry. The galvanic cell is a way of obtaining electrical energy via a redox reaction because when there is a transfer of electrons, you have moving charges. And when you have moving charges, you can generate an electric current. This is something you talk about a lot more in physics than we do in chemistry, so you'll just have to trust me on it right now. To create a galvanic cell, you need a couple things. You need two metals, one which can undergo oxidation while the other one is undergoing reduction. You need some way to connect these two metals through a closed circuit to allow the flow of the electrical field by a transfer of electrons. And then you need something to help rebalance the charges, either a salt bridge or a porous plate between the two sections that will allow extra anions or cations to move. But before we get into the details of the galvanic cell, we need to talk a little bit about the activity series. We know from the discussion of ionic compounds earlier this year that metals are what they release their electrons. Electrons move away from a, the metal in a chemical reaction. Now different metals have different levels of reactivity. Some are very active and some are not particularly active at all. Highly reactive metals, and these are all of the ones in our group one on the periodic table, well, they will oxidize quite readily when exposed to water and the further you move down the column in group one, the more violent the reaction. So this picture is the reaction of a solid piece of potassium with water, which give you, gives you potassium hydroxide in solution and hydrogen gas. And there is so much heat in this reaction that the hydrogen gas ignites. If you check out YouTube, I'm sure you can find some pretty spectacular videos of solid metals reacting in water. This is an example of a highly reactive metal. Not all metals are that reactive. You know from your own life experience that most metals, when they are exposed to water, like when your car is rained on, it doesn't explode into you know, vapors of hydrogen gas. So other metals need something a little bit more serious than just water. They might need an acid, such as this example here of magnesium reacting with acid, again to produce hydrogen gas or oxygen. I talked about the first video about how oxidation came from the understanding of substances reacting with oxygen and when oxygen would take those electrons away. So in our rusting car example, we're not making hydrogen gas an explosion, but iron is reacting with oxygen to create an iron oxide, which we see as those little bits of rust. More active metals will then lose electrons or will oxidize when exposed to less active metals under the right circumstances. You may remember from the lab experience that when the zinc piece of zinc metal was placed into a copper sulfate solution, you saw this black precipitate forming, and you may also have noticed that the blue color of the copper sulfate was becoming less. We can compare it to this example here. Zinc is more reactive. It is more likely to give up its electrons when exposed to copper. And so in the reaction, we have the zinc metal being oxidized. It's losing electrons to the copper that's in solution. The copper comes out of solution as a black precipitate. And over time, that piece of zinc metal will dissolve completely. So we can order the various metals on how reactive they are. And this is called the activity series. And so we see here is our zinc. And in the general, the rule is that any metal you know, at one place in the activity series will be able to oxidize in the presence of another metal that is below it. So here are two zinc and copper. On the bottom of the activity series, you see we have gold. And you may know that gold is not very reactive while silver will tarnish over time, which is an oxidation reaction, gold will not. Gold stays shiny um, forever and ever, even the ones that they have dug up in archaeological digs. The gold is not a very reactive metal. Now what about electrical energy? Because of course in these galvanic cells we're making electrical, we're obtaining electrical energy by chemical reaction. 
Well, electrical energy is caused by a difference in electrical potential. And I said in the very beginning, you get a current when you have charges flowing. And you have to have a different amount of charges from one side of the circuit to the other. You have to separate, then, your oxidation and reduction reactions in order to have a difference in potential. When we put that piece of zinc in the copper sulfate solution, you're not able to obtain an electrical current because it's all spontaneously happening in the same place. And so there's not a buildup of charges on one, in one place that are higher than the other place and that there be a difference in potential. Water is used often to illustrate electricity, and so we, I just grabbed this little illustration that says, you know, water's not going to flow unless there's a difference in the potential between the two ends of the pipe. And there needs to be a similar difference in potential between the electrical potential at two ends of a wire, or electricity will not flow. When it comes to the galvanic cells, then, we have to separate our oxidation from our reduction. There are several key parts of a galvanic cell. You need to have the electrodes, the two metals that we are going to use for oxidation and reduction. They have to have different levels of reactivity. They need to be immersed in some sort of solution, or in the case of dry cells that I'll talk about later, the things that we normally call batteries. It's a pasty solution, not necessarily liquid. And we call these two parts half cells. So the oxidation half cell is separated from the reduction half cell. You have to some, have some kind of connection between the two half cells to allow the current flow. And then you need something like a salt bridge or a porous plate that allows a rebalancing of charges. Otherwise, you will not get electric current for very long. So here's this illustration from the first page. Let's go over the different parts. Here we have our zinc electrode on one side, and it's in a zinc sulfate solution. On the other side, the other half cell has a copper electrode, and it has a copper sulfate solution. Now we know that the zinc is higher on the activity list than copper. It is a more active metal. So zinc is going to undergo oxidation, whereas copper will be undergoing reduction. Now we have the electric wire connecting the two electrodes. And when it comes to metal, the electrons in metal are, are in a solid piece of pure metal are not tightly bound to their own particular nucleus. They're all sort of loosely floating around. That's why it's able to transfer an electric current. Over time, electrons will actually move through a wire if an electric current flows through it, but they don't move at the speed of the current. The current is pushed by an electric field, which is part of the electromagnetic wave system, and so it moves at nearly the speed of light. Electrons sort of meander along more like a tortoise. So in any case, these electrons are so loosely attached that the copper ions that, sitting, that are sitting here in solution of this copper sulfate can actually go out and grab an electron from these electrons that are here in the wire. Then by, or actually we'll grab two electrons because this is a two plus um, copper sulfate has copper at a, at a two plus charge. So that the copper will grab these two electrons, turn into solid copper, and just just connect itself to the copper electrode. Because it's doing that, because it's grabbing these two electrons, it's sort of creating a pull that will pull two electrons off the zinc side of things into the wire. And so then we have a zinc molecule with a two plus charge going into the zinc sulfate solution. The, over time, the copper electrode will deposit more and more pieces of copper. It'll actually get bigger and bigger. And your zinc electrode will get smaller and smaller as the zinc goes into solution. Maybe the zinc gives up its electrons first and the, you know, allows the, there to be a higher potential difference in the wire so that the copper can grab it second. Who knows? Reduction and oxidation, remember, are happening simultaneously. We won't worry about which one actually occurs first. It's sometimes easier to think about it that the, of the copper grabbing the electrons out of the wire and then sort of pulling them off the zinc on the other side. The electrode that is undergoing oxidation is known as the anode because it is attracting electrons because of this buildup of positive charges here. You can see as more and more zinc goes into solution, this solution would become more and more positive. 
When the copper moves out of solution, it leaves behind what's left over, which is that sulfate molecule. And so over here, this is getting more and more negative. This becomes known as the cathode because it attracts positive ions. One of the, the ways of remembering the anode and the cathode so far as what happens on it are to just use the beginning letters of each word. So if you can think about an ox, the animal there, or a red cat, that can help you remember that at the anode you are experiencing oxidation, but reduction goes on at the cathode. The negative and positive um, tells you what's being attracted. So cations, which are not a word that we're using very often in this textbook, but cations are positive, and so that's what this little positive designation tells you here. Cations, cations are attracted to the cathode because of this buildup of negative ions. And conversely, anions are attracted to the anode because of this buildup of positive ions. Now, if we didn't have a salt bridge, the last part of this galvanic cell, we very quickly would have a buildup of negative and positive charges that would be getting in the way of this free flow of electrons. And so the salt bridge allows sulfite ions, which are negative, to move back over this way to add to the positive buildup and kind of neutralize things. And zinc ions can travel the other way so that the solution itself that is in each side of these half cells stays more or less neutral at a zero charge until you've used up all the zinc or you've run out of copper in the solution and then the reaction will stop. This reaction is what's happening inside batteries. The little batteries that we use in flashlights and various electronic equipment is actually more officially known as a dry cell because it's just one um, electrode with an anode and a cathode in it. Whereas the substance that's a, or the structure that's a battery, such as our car battery over here, has got many little individual dry cells. But anyway, back to your single dry cell, the, the good old you know double A or triple A battery, the Two metals that are involved here are zinc, and its electrode is actually set up as a casing around the outside of the battery, and not copper, but manganese set up as manganese oxide, and it is found actually as a paste in the middle. And so this is why it's known as a dry cell. It's not a liquid solution in a beaker, but it is a pasty sort of um, almost uh, dry. I mean, almost, it's, it's got a little bit of moisture in it, but not much. And then there's a, a carbon electrode that allows for the transfer of the charges. And so this situation, the anode is again the zinc, the cathode is inside the, um, because of the reaction with the manganese oxide, and the carbon then doesn't directly participate as a cathode, but it allows the transfer. When all of the zinc or the manganese has been used up, then your battery has run out of juice because these batteries are not rechargeable. Your car battery is made up of a series of dry cells, usually about six of them all lined up side by side. And inside the dry cell you've got a combination of lead and some kind of lead um, oxide. Here we've got um, or some, some other lead compound. Here we have lead oxide. And the whole thing is bathed in this sulfuric acid solution. Because in the two reactions that happen each of the half cells, both of these compounds, both the lead itself and the lead oxide, are being turned into lead sulfate. And so that's why car batteries can be recharged. Because by putting electricity in, we can make this a reversible reaction and take turn lead from lead sulfate back into lead or from lead sulfate back into lead oxide and refill um, up the, the hydrogen or the sulfuric acid in the middle. So your dry cell batteries are not rechargeable. In general, there are some rechargeable forms. Your car batteries are rechargeable. And a lot of that is due to the choice of what chemicals you're using to create that battery. There are many combinations of metals that work for batteries, and if you think about some of the, the names of batteries, um, they tell you usually what metals are involved, but that's just sort of extra information. That's not something that I'm going to focus on in this class. So that completes what I want to say about the galvanic cell, just give you an overview of how we are able to use chemistry to make electricity.